Hello, okay. welcome everyone. You're going to be inspired and you're going to have constructive things that you can do to start to apply it in your real life. We have a special presentation for you today with our special guest, Dr. Frederick Graves, who is a lawyer for many years, but not your ordinary lawyer. He's going to teach us a number of things about the way that the lawyers and the judges actually work, uh, his personal stories, and how he's developed a mission to help you and I, just average folks, go into court and win without a lawyer. And this is an amazing prospect when we're thinking about trying to correct a wrong in our society to, to seek justice where there is injustice. You know, we're told to go to the ballot box. We're told to get picket signs and go out and rally and make a lot of noise. We're told even sometimes to call or write or go somehow meet our elected officials. Um, we're also said, well, go to court. And then you realize, oh, that's going to be very expensive because of the lawyers involved. We all want to restore our nation to its former glory where people are free. And I have a vision of thousands and thousands of regular people without the assistance of a lawyer going into the courts all over this country and using the courts to get justice against anybody who should try to violate your rights whether that be a, a government agency or a private corporation or another individual. So again, thank you for being here. This is going to be an incredible hour together. We're going to give you the inspiration you need to learn what you need to learn to go into a court and win without a lawyer. And we're going to give you direct actions to take to further your education toward the end of the time together. Let me introduce our guest, Frederick Graves. He's been so kind to spend this hour with us to introduce to us his work that he's been doing over a couple of decades in terms of developing coursework for people and his overall mission that we all share. Dr. Grace, go ahead and say hi. Hello. Good Hello. to be here. Good to see you. You're in good health. How are you today? Very good health and very thankful. It's a wonderful day and God is good. And, and the system, let's start off with that if you, if you like. The system is good. It's the people in my profession, mostly, who abuse the system. I, this, when I use the term system, I talk about the rules of court, the rules of procedure, and the rules of evidence. That's what I call the system, not the people, not the judges, not the clerks, certainly not the lawyers, but the system itself. And it's so easy to learn. And that's how all this got started. So uh, where do you want me to go? Just I'm so lucky to have met you and talked with you about your story. It's really, it's, it's not like, it's not a story you hear every day. Someone going to law school and then determining to uh, bring the law to everyone. So maybe a little bit about the before time, <laughs> okay. you know, and then what, right. what, what's, what motivated you to, to go to law school and get a JD and then the things you learned with your exposure to the system and the people and, uh, and then what you've created since. All right. Well, I once had long hair. I had a beard down to my belt. I lived on a sailboat that I built in my backyard. And I worked odd jobs. If I had $50 in my pocket, that was, that was a good day. So I was on my way up along the Jersey coast headed north. And there's a place called Shark River in New Jersey. And I went in there. I was tired. And came off the ocean, of course, and went into Shark River and uh, tied up at a dock. It didn't have to pay dockage. And we were all, I was always looking for somewhere I wouldn't have to pay dockage. So I tied up and right across from where the dock was, was a, a big steel fence. And three fellows were building a catamaran. And since I'd built my boat and they were building a boat, and we got to know each other. And one of the fellows, uh, we, we became really dear friends and had a lot in common, had a lot of fun together, enjoyed the same kind of music and everything. Anyway, uh, he went on to go to Stetson undergraduate school in the land and then went on to law school. His father was a Manhattan attorney. And he asked me one day, he says, why don't you, why don't you sit for the LSAT, the law school aptitude test? And I said, well, you know, okay. I, all right. At that time I was teaching in a private Christian school in Orlando. And so I took the test and by the grace of God, I scored very well. And uh, 
Then he said, well, you ought to apply to some law schools. And I said, I'll tell you what, Jim, I'll apply to one law school and if they accept me, I'll go. Otherwise, this is off the table. So they made a big mistake, Clint. They accepted me. And uh, when I passed the bar, three years of law school and over $100,000 later, working as a carpenter and teaching night school and things like that to make the money, they called me a crusader right off the bat. And later they called me a litigation terrorist. Litigation I, what? Terrorist, because I didn't take prisoners. Remember, I, I ran a fishing boat. I scraped barnacles. I cleaned toilets, worked as a bartender. You know, I knew what it was like for the average man or woman to be without. And uh, so anyway, when I started going to law school and started taking classes, something didn't fit right off the bat. Here I had grown up in a small Ohio town. I'm telling too much of my history, but small Ohio town had two lawyers. Uh, Mr. Bennett and uh, I forget the other fellow's name. But they were respectable people. They were honorable people. Everybody was, you know, thought they were good people and they were. And so I thought, wow, being a lawyer, that's something really special for an old fisherman, ferry boat captain. And, uh, but then I found out that, that there are some really, really wonderful, honorable judges. And then there are some that are, cantankerous and high-minded and and uh, really should be doing something else, maybe working at Walmart. And then I found out that over the years that an awful lot of lawyers are just downright crooked. Not all of them, not saying all of them. It's, and I think lawyers that do wills and trusts and things like that, they may overcharge for what they do, but at least it's hard for them to cheat anybody when, other than taking too much money for what they do. But litigators, and prosecutors, um, these people have a different idea about what's right and wrong and win at any cost. And the bar even has continuing legal education classes for, for us lawyers to learn you know, how we're supposed to behave. And they have those classes because we need to be curtailed in our behavior. Um, one of my professors was my age. I didn't go to law school when I was 39. And I remember when I, I got my license, he said, well, you have a, a license to steal now. But I just decided that uh, I would try to be honest about it as much as I possibly could and started out at $50 an hour, where other lawyers were charging $300 an hour. And I was glad to make $50 an hour back then. But anyway, the thing that came about over the years was after 10 years of practice, a light came on that I want that same light to come on for you wonderful people and for a few million of you, uh, over 250 million of you actually can't afford a lawyer. That's according to the American Bar Association. I didn't make that up. So when this light came on, I, I remember what I was doing. Uh, and I said, oh my gosh, I can teach this to people. I'd written for Yachting Magazine, Boating Magazine, Rudder, written books and things, and had been, you know, acclaimed for being able to make complicated things easy to understand. So now I decided, well, heck, I'll just do this. And my friend Fred Redden said, uh, we have to get you a website. And that's how it all began, Clint. And now this old man's on the warpath. Uh, now that I know that you can do this, for the first time in the history of the world, you have access to the law, each and every one of you. Now, I've got my iPhone 11 here. If I want to look up the law of dog bites in Indiana. You know, what, is, what are the appellate court opinions about dog bites in Indiana or Louisiana or anywhere else? Uh, and what are the statutes? Are there any statutes? It's all right here. Never before in the history of the world. And, and I want to emphasize that with people. I wish I could get other people, and I hope you will, Clint, and people listening to me. I hope you'll tell other people that this is like an awakening. It's like a renaissance. Uh, I didn't make the renaissance. Here it is. And before this, you had to spend thousands of dollars to have all those books, pay West Publishing Company, all these this money, to have all those books in your office if you wanted to practice law, or you had to live in a town that had a law library paid for by taxes. Now here's my law library right here. 
And what I found out on that day was, was I was actually looking up a rule. And I was about to, about to write a motion, comes now the plaintiff flying through his undersigned attorney and moves this honorable court to enter an order pursuant to rule. And I forgot the rule number. I think it was rule 1.370, which is about uh, request for admissions. <laughs> and I looked at the book and there was, it was only like 30 pages. I said, oh my gosh, 30 pages. The book was this thick. But there were only about 30 pages of that book that I had paid any attention to in 10 years. And so the light came on. And I like to think that an awful lot of people who otherwise would have been thrown to the wolves have gotten my course. And having access to the law through the internet and having this course, I'm sure somebody can come up with a better one, at least now, at least mine's out there. Maybe someone will do a much better job tomorrow. I don't know, but at least it's there. And with what I teach in this course that an eighth grader can learn in a weekend, anybody can do this. And so for the first time, now we can actually say to people, as the Bible sometimes says, you are without excuse. You don't, you don't have to sit by and say, oh my gosh, isn't it terrible what's happening in the world? Because frankly, the terrible things happening in this world have been happening for a very long time. I mean, they used to hold people underwater to see if they were guilty. You know, I mean, and that hasn't been all that long ago. Uh, the world becomes better for everyone as some of us, right now, very few of us, but some of us make an effort to go to court and force a judge to change what we call, what is really called common law appellate court opinions. And that's why we have these decisions of the Supreme Court today that are completely off the wall. Uh, I don't want to get into it. We could go on and on. We go down some rabbit path. And what I want to stick with is trying to, to urge people to understand and urge you to urge others to understand that no longer do the, the American people, or for that matter, the people in India or anywhere else, Taiwan, wherever, the people themselves in this planet no longer have to be victimized by an elite oligarchy of individuals who happen to go to law school and get a law degree so that they have a license to represent you in court and maybe do a good job if you're very, very lucky, or maybe just take all the money they can possibly get. Uh, I don't know. Did we cover that pretty well so far? Yeah, that's great. It's wonderful. And um... There, in particular, yeah, I was really impressed by an article on on your course. One of the articles about natural law or common law, and once I read that, I understood that you were definitely uh, my partner because in there you actually described historically what has happened to jurisprudence, just the the very idea of what is law itself and how it's been um, perverted over time in order to serve that elite class that you're talking about. So yeah, I really encourage people to, I really want everyone to read that article. Uh, and it's a true education in the sense that people need to know what has happened. We, we haven't always been this, it hasn't always been this way, but uh, it's been through a concerted effort basically to convert uh, true law into this uh, statutory regulatory well, as, as you say in your article, it, jurisprudence is now understood as case law, like precedence. Everyone talks about, well, what's precedence? <laughs> Even the average person knows what precedence means. And, and we think that, oh, well, because of some famous court case from 1905, you know, we're stuck today. We're like, oh, too bad, unless it's overturned by, by an equally high court. Uh, that's the kind of idea people have about jurisprudence that's been propagated through the media, I guess, through school to some degree. Um, what is what is maybe what is true law? What would you say is if it isn't if jurisprudence isn't just a series of judgments and precedents over many, over many years, what is it? <laughs> Big question. Okay, <laughs> I'll try. Well, there's law that makes apples fall from trees. They don't fall up; they fall down. Same law makes babies smile if you tickle them, <laughs> and that is the big law. And, and, and if you, if any of your people are Bible people and you look at 
the Gospel of John, chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning, uh, and the word there is logos. In the beginning was the logos. That's what it is in Greek. And the logos was understood by the Greek to be that which determines the fate of men and nations according to what we do or don't do. That law can't change. Man's law should, and if the people themselves will get involved in this process instead of letting the lawyers run the show, man's law should do everything it can to try to keep in mind, among other things, I mean, above everything else, keep in mind that this logos that cannot change will determine the destiny of ourselves as individuals and our nation. Because if we do wrong, we're going to get wrong. What goes around comes around. Karma is a real thing. Mm. The problem we have, and we've always had, is that we have people that meddle with their own opinions about what's right and wrong or what the truth is. Of course, the truth is what it is, no matter what opinion we have about what the truth might be. And what's right is right. Now, I may not see what's right as clearly as someone else, Mother Teresa, for example. I mean, she probably sees what's right a much clearer than this old man. But whatever is right is right, no matter what I see or what I believe. But when I happen to be sitting on a high court and making decisions about what is right or wrong based on my personal opinion or the kaleidoscopically changing opinion of the so-called public or collective, then we get away from this idea that there is such a thing as the logos, there, that, you know, that, that what, what people call God. Uh, you know, there's different ways of looking at God. All the, all the religions agree that there is this unseen hand, as George Washington called it. Benjamin Franklin called it that. Marcus Aurelius even called that. The, the, there's an unseen hand that orders the universe. But when we have judges that are ignoring the consequence of the operation of that unseen hand, then we have problems. And the problems filter down to the little guy, like ferry boat captains and fishing boat captains and carpenters and people that lay roofing on roofs in Florida in, in July. And uh, it just, uh, it's just something that needs to be understood by the people. And I just have one little voice. Uh, I just want other people to understand that this is something that we can do. We can change what's going on. We can make these people in high places begin to realize that the law that is, that the law that makes the apples fall also makes countries fall. It, it makes uh, divorces. It, it, make, it drives young men and women to turn to drugs and alcohol instead of dealing with their problems. Uh, not, that, not that there's some insidious motive in the logos, it's just a consequence that can't be avoided. Now, the people then say, well, how can I make a difference? And the answer is, think about Rosa Parks. She, she didn't want to ride on the back of the bus. And that law didn't change because they par paraded across the bridge over at Selma. I mean, that might have influenced some politicians but it didn't change the law. The law changed when somebody went to court. Brown versus Board of Education. You see, uh, schools are integrated today because of a decision that came down from a judge when he picked up a pen and signed an order. Uh, what's the thing, the Miranda, that was an action. The Miranda warning was actually a case, it was in Florida, that decided that by golly, if if you're going to do these things, you've got to tell people that they have certain rights before you start questioning them. The law changes when people do something to change it. But if you can't find a lawyer to go to court for you, what do you do? And, and, and people say, well, what about the old adage? You know, if, if you represent yourself in court, you have a fool for a lawyer. Well, I, I, I come back to them. I say, well, what if you're a fishing boat captain? and you're lucky to have $50 in your pocket, what are you going to do? What can you do? What if you're a single mom? The other morning, a lady called me, her one-year-old baby was taken away. 
She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have any parents. She doesn't have no friends. It took her baby away. What are you going to do? And, and for the bar to, to come out and say, well, hire a lawyer. Well, yeah, sure. Isn't that great? Hire a lawyer. But because I came from where I came from, I know how ridiculous that is. And so I do the best I can to try to make this course better and better every year. It's been going on since 1997. And if I live any longer, I'll do my best to make it better. But now the question is, will the American public begin to realize that there really are two, over 250 million of you who can't afford a lawyer? And I can't tell you how many times over these years I've gotten emails or phone calls from people and they've said, you know, I hired a lawyer, I mortgaged a home, I did everything I could, I gave him $30,000, $50,000, $100,000, and, and then I got your course and I found out that he didn't do any of the things he could have done. Well, what's that all about? So, you know, I just want people to understand that you don't have to be hoodwinked by these, these elitist people who claim that just because they went to law school and passed the bar that they're a whole lot smarter than you because they may, they may know something that you don't know, but they're not smarter than you. They don't have a higher IQ than you. Uh, I wish I could tell one story about a young man when I was teaching in a Christian school. Uh, his mother was the, the, the counselor. And Billy, I, I taught there three years. Billy was in my biology class in 10th grade. Then he was in my chemistry class in 11th grade. He didn't do well. Billy wasn't the sharpest crayon in the bunch. And then the senior year, I wanted to teach a physics class. I only had, I had, I had eight, eight kids in the class. And one of them was Billy. And his mother said, no, this took me aside. Mr. Graves, you can't. But he can't, Billy can't be in that class. He, he won't be able to figure that out. I'm going to make my point here if you people will kindly listen to this old man. And I said, well, here's the deal. Uh, and, and she went to the headmaster. And he came to me and he said, you know, you, you, you can't have Billy. I said, I'll tell you what, either I get Billy in my physics class or I quit. So Billy was in the class. And I taught the way Mr. Webster taught the most important person in my life when I was a child growing up, certainly, certainly the most important teacher. I would put a problem on the board and then I'd turn around to the children. I'd say, what's the story? I'd let them try to figure it out. And most of the time, the valedictorian, his name was Jim Root, or the salutatorian, I forgot what her name was, they would jump up and they'd have the answer and they were so proud and they want everybody else to know, gee, I, I know the answer, I know the answer. Every once in a while, I'd put a question on the board draw a diagram or whatever, I'd say, what the story? Billy would shoot his hand up. And the other kids were stuck. They were stymied, they had no idea. But Billy saw it a different way. And the way he saw it was genius. So I have become fully persuaded that in each and every person, there's this gem of genius. And that together, there's nothing we cannot do. But if we sit back and imagine someone else is going to fix the world for us, then we can't call ourselves patriots. We just can't. And, and to be angry about something and to find fault with something and to complain about this, that, and the other thing, and oh, isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? Uh, you know, put on your big boy pants, you know, grow up. And now, as I say again, you've got no excuse. With my course and the ability to research the law, just as well as any lawyer could do, in fact, better than you could do 30 years ago when you had to go to the law library and look at, you know, 8,000 books and try to figure out which one do I look in. Now you just go to Google and say, dog bite law, Illinois, and you find all kinds of law, all kinds of things that then you can go to the judge and say, this is what the law is. Here is the admissible facts that I got into the evidence using the, my five discovery tools, request for admissions, request for production, interrogatories, depositions, and subpoenas. You only have five, not 123 or 7,000. There's only five, not too hard to learn. So here's the facts that I got into the evidence as admissible evidence into the record. Here's the law. I moved the court to enter an order pursuant to the law. And guess what? It works. It worked for me over and over and over again. And 
I took no prisoners, like I say, and, and just the people out there owe this to those wonderful young people who, who scaled the hills at Iwo Jima, that got off those amphibious vehicles on the beach at Normandy. We owe them something. And if it's not to stand up and enforce this, this system, I shouldn't use that word, to enforce this legal profession, to uphold the law and give the people their due, then I don't know, shame on us, really. I, I, don't, I don't really know what all you want me to say, Clint. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to people, but <laughs> that's how I see it. I, I think that people have the idea, I'm just looking at my notes here that I had, that uh, they see lawyers on television. Mm -hmm. Any lawyer you see on television, he wants he wants a big case. He wants something where he can make $100,000 as his one third or 40% of whatever he collects for you without charging you any money. He's not, it won't cost you a dime until I win. Oh, that's great. What about the, what about that lonely mother where their baby's been taken away? Do you think any of those lawyers on TV are going to take her case? Not on your tintype. So what does she do? What she does is she needs some people in her community that know what I teach to use the legal research options that she has and with the help of some people that are near her to fight back, make these people, you know, say, well, who said that I, that I beat my child? Who said I was abusing my child? Where is that person? I want to cross-examine that person. And what do they know? It, it's not difficult. The principles are so easy to learn. It really is common sense. But if, if, you, if you can't hire a lawyer and you can't get one to work for you, then what do you do? Then you look at family lawyers who could encourage their parties to settle. They don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's known. People in my profession know this is true. Family lawyers will take a couple that are, they're already having enough problems. They got emotional problems. If they have children involved, even more emotional problems. They got property to divide. They're sad. Uh, nobody's spending much time, in the, no, nobody in my profession spends much time telling these people, you know, why don't we get together? Let's talk about this. Maybe you don't really want to get a divorce. Maybe we can work this out somehow. Let's go to counseling. No, no, they're not going to do that. They're not going to make a dime doing that. But they will make as much money as they can, keeping these people at odds and, and uh, talking to the lawyer on the other side and making deals. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. Uh, other litigators who could settle a case don't. I had a situation, a real true story. Um, a lady came to me to do a will. And I did the will. And then sometime later, uh, she passed away. And she had a friend. She left. She, of course, when I did the will, she told me she had this friend who lived in Tennessee. They would come down to St. Petersburg, Florida, and they'd have a good time. Two old ladies. You can just imagine two old ladies having a good time. And uh, so she died. And she left things to her friend from Tennessee. And she had two children that never bothered to come see her. And they came up with uh, a Xerox copy of a, a purported will. They didn't have an original document. They had something with a Xerox copy. And they tried to say that that was a later will and that they should be able to probate this Xerox copy, that they should get mom's estate instead of this friend from Tennessee. Well, it turned out that the fellow had actually written a book on how to forge documents with a Xerox machine. And that's actually true. And then they hired a lawyer. And they didn't have all of what you're going to learn about in my course called the elements. There are certain elements that the statute provided if we're going to probate a Xerox copy. There's certain elements that have to be met. They didn't have all of them. I knew that right away. And I fought them and I fought them. And then they hired another lawyer. It's a true story. As I sit here, it's a true story. It's amazing. So this went on for over a year. And these, this, these two young people, I guess the good thing about it is they were, they were paying the lawyer. I guess that's good. They've had to pay money. And uh, so they finally hired one more lawyer. His name was Gardner Beckett. And he was a lawyer emeritus. He was one of these slow talking southern gentlemen uh, and they had actually had a special celebration for him he was such a such high high muck -a muck in the in the legal society in st petersburg 
Well, we had to go to a final hearing and I'm getting to my point, believe it or not, just that you understand it's a true story. And so Mr. Beckett started putting on his case and he called witnesses and, and then he went and finally he sat down. Judge Penning said, well, Mr. Graves, what do you have? And I said, well, Mr. Your Honor, I, I'm waiting for Mr. Beckett to say that he rests his case. The judge looked at me like, and the judge was a brigadier general, retired by the way. So he looks at me and I'm, I'm just a fisherman. I'm a carpenter, what do I know? I cleaned toilets when I was younger. So he looks at me and he says, what's, what's this all about? And I said, it's very simple, Your Honor. I'm waiting for him to say on the record that he closes his case, he's done. He's got nothing else to put up. Beckett then says in his slow drawling way, well, Your Honor, you know, we're pretty much, we pretty much did most of pretty much, you know, I said, that's not good enough. I want him to say he's got nothing else. And this went on for three or four minutes. And finally, the old man finally said, well, we rest our case. And I said, fine, I move for a directed verdict. And Judge Pennick jumped up out of the seat. And he said, I'll be right back. And he, I told him what it was about. And he went to the law library, came back an hour later. This was like six o'clock in the evening now. And everybody wants to go home. And he comes back in the room. He, he said, Fred's right. Those were his exact words. Fred's right. So as I was getting up to leave and I was gathering my books together, I walked past the table on the other side where Beckett and his clients were sitting. And I heard Beckett say to his clients, there was no way we could have known this was going to happen. Those were his words. I knew it was going to happen for over a year. And so did Gardner Beckett. And that's the legal profession in a nutshell. And if the American people want to continue to allow these people to run their lives, then good luck to all of you. And we'll just keep sliding down the slippery slope. But if the American people want to learn how to do this and how to start controlling judges and how to controlling lawyers and how to make the law apply for them and not for the big corporations and not for the filthy rich that can hire 20 lawyers, uh, then we can see a change in this country, but I can't do it by myself. I, it, I, I need you people to do this, not only to do it for yourselves, but to tell other people, hey, this is real. It isn't about this crazy old man, Mr. Graves. It's not about him. It's about something that he was shown years ago that we all need to discover for ourselves and pray that the light will come on so we can realize it's not rocket science. It's not differential calculus. It's just a handful of rules. And once you understand the rules, now you can control the court and make this world a better place for everyone. Thank you. There's so much to say about what you've just created. Thank you very much. You do make the class very simple. You do have, you've succeeded in, in really making it very easy to understand. Um, from the beginning, uh, the very first, first couple of lessons that lay out the big picture is what you call it. So you kind of, within the first few lessons, you kind of understand the, the whole thing. And then it's just a matter of going through lessons and learning the details on each thing. And so you've done a really great job as far as that's concerned. And we're going to take a little peek. I'm going to put on my screen just so people have us just a look at what it looks like. But I want to say again about what you're talking about, people taking up the, the challenge of becoming their own advocate in a court of law. And I was wondering, do you, have, do you have any idea of how many people say, even currently, go to, to court on their own without a lawyer today? How many, there must be a good number of people doing, we just don't hear about it. We don't read about it too much. It's, it's not something that's, that's widely talked about. I, I mean, if I was a judge, how often would I see somebody rep representing themselves? Well, if you were a judge, you'd probably cringe when you saw one because an awful lot of them don't have any idea what they're doing uh, they go to these various other websites where they learn things like you know my name in all capital letters that's not me uh, one person actually believes that by copywriting her name that now she can't be arrested because nobody can write her name on a document because she copyrighted her name i mean there's some people who got some weird ideas but it doesn't work so people go to court and they say, you know, one person said that he actually wrote me an email and said he was the son of God, um, that he was a man on the land and that he was 
on and on and on. There are some people out there that are smoking something weird. But when we do this the right way, heads roll. And people that are doing it the way that I teach are winning. I mean, the testimonials on the website are from real people. And finally, there's just so many of them, I had, I had to put them all in a database and I just I get some all the time. I don't add anymore. It's just from time to time, I get a really good one, I put it in. But people are winning. But, but too many people assume that, well, I know the law or my constitutional rights are violated. So I go into court. That's all I need to say is my constitutional rights were violated. Now I win. Well, it doesn't work like that. You can't play baseball with a tennis racket. I say that almost every day. You can't play baseball with a tennis racket. The, the umpire will not allow it. You might say, but it's not fair. I need a bigger, <laughs> a bigger thing to hit that ball with because it's coming. You know, I need mm -hmm. a tennis racket. Uh, well, sorry, Charlie. Uh, this is a court of law that people died so you could have. Now, how about respecting the system that exists and use the system in the way it's designed to be used with pleadings and discovery and motions and orders and 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 start doing things the right way and yes people are doing this more and more i, I think this we can hardly call it a groundswell but it certainly is a movement that is hopefully getting off the ground and it, it's kind of exciting really when you think about the possibility that all of a sudden now that we have this zoom and social media and things like that where people can communicate about these things you have to remember that when I was a boy, if you wanted to learn about something, you, you, you got the newspaper. And then later on, we had radio. And there was no television when I was six years old. We didn't have television. Uh, now communications is there. This is the information age. And now I like to think that the information age is going to usher in this age of legal activism, not just to be a, a burr under somebody's saddle, but legal activism and where we would spill ink instead of spilling blood. I mean, you know, let's think about that. Remember that every war that ever was, all of the hundreds of thousands of gallons of blood that was spilled, all of that stopped when somebody picked up a pen. And words stop war. Not, not swords, not guns, not bombs. Words ultimately have to be used to stop war. Well, why not do the same thing with what's going on in our community? If we don't like what the school board is doing, we don't like what the city council is doing, my next door neighbor's tree fell on my house, whatever's going wrong, somebody's wronged you, you have this system that Blackstone, who wrote commentaries on the laws of England back in the 18th century, uh, you have this system, this court, it is your power. That's what it is. The court is the theater of the power of the people. And the people don't have enough clue. They, I, I may have said this to you, Clint, that it's like people have a 357 Magnum in their hip pocket. They don't, have, they don't even know they have it. But it's there. You have it now. These rights belong to you now. Now, now you need to know it's there. And then you need to know which end of the pistol to point at the enemy. And of course, if you don't use it correctly, you could get hurt. But if you use it correctly, you can, you can affect change in your community and change in your nation, change in your state, change at all levels. And, but it, it needs to be a community effort, not just individuals who say, oh, well, I have a problem. I wanna solve my problem. And then when they finish solving their problem, uh, then they don't, they don't make any effort to help other people with the same problem. So when we begin to help each other to understand, by golly, you know, what that old man said is true. I can learn how to use requests for production. I can make people produce documents. I can make them produce a toothbrush. If I need to see their toothbrush, to, and that's going to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence, I get to see it. And if they don't want to turn it over, I can go through this particular process that's in this course and have them sent to jail till they turn over their toothbrush or their flat tire or the broken ladder or whatever it was, and or documents, as long as they're reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. All this is so simple. And yet the people don't have any idea that they have this power. Each and every one of you listening to me right now, you have this power to make people go to jail if they don't obey the law. And it's, it's easy to do.
It's not hard to do at all. Yes. What about that in the spirit of everyone working together as a community to do this? And I just have the idea that many people see an immediate opportunity to go to work in, in, in their lives, like, with, like you said, with something they're dealing with. But they could become, in a way, they could become a, um, a specialist and help others uh, as well. Because you can have somebody else uh, be your representative too, can't you? That's not a lawyer. Well, they can't represent you. They can certainly help you. There's no, there's no limit on legal education. But what's the old saying? It takes a community. Mm -hmm. is, that what, is that what it is? It takes a community. It takes a village. Yeah, I think it's it takes a it. village. Okay, it takes a village. So if the people themselves will get together with other people, and we people are doing that, and there are groups of people are getting studying the course, and they're understanding that, hey, I have access to the law as well as anybody else. I can do this. And when they get together and start helping each other to do it, now you've got a, a group of parents that aren't happy with what the school board is doing. And they can all get together and work and figure out how to put this together and make it happen. That that helps. But if if one single mom or a single dad or whatever uh, is trying to fight City Hall on his own, uh, it's a little harder. He can do it. And I've got testimonial after testimonial about people who have done it but if we can come together and make this something that it does take a village where the people begin to see you know we, we owe this to ourselves as as a people as, as a people. the american people yeah yeah so there are a couple of things that i've heard that people continue to be intimidated by the whole thing there's one this idea that you're not allowed to practice law without a license so maybe you can clarify exactly what is the the statutory limitation or is there something that people need to do uh, or say to make sure that they don't get in well, trouble it's pretty easy yeah uh, the, the the law of course i disagree with the law I, personally i think anybody sh should, should be able to represent anybody else or at least go to court for somebody else i believe that with all my heart but that's not the law yet maybe it will change but the the thing is that when somebody teaches somebody else for example let's say somebody has a problem and they don't know they never heard the word interrogatory oh my gosh interrogatory oh that's too complicated for me i i, I don't even know how to spell it well, how long would it take to learn how to spell interrogatory i mean it's, it's not you know you can spell that can spell uh gigabyte <laughs> about the same length right we all know what a gigabyte is and interrogatory just you can, and people don't know that you can you can, when you're in a case once you're in a case that you can serve somebody with a set of questions that they have to answer under oath the lawyer can't answer it they have to answer it under oath under penalties of perjury and the, and they have to answer it with, with in good faith or you can go through this process and have them put in jail until they do answer it well, people don't know that, Clint. They have no idea what that means. So if, if somebody that's listening to me or somebody that has the course and, and the next door neighbor is having a hard time you know, whatever, and you go over and say, well, did you know that you can use interrogatories to make them answer this under oath? Well, that's not practicing law. That's teaching the law. And, and if the people, the muckamucks in high places, if they get to the point where they say that we can't teach each other what the law is, then I'll be on the streets with signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they're, because okay. they're, because I just, I'll go ballistic. The people have a right to know the law and it should not be kept from them. And if you have your Bible, look at the gospel of Luke chapter 50, chapter 52. Luke chapter 11, verse 52. And this carpenter, whatever you may think about him, uh, doesn't really matter. I'll just tell you what he said. He said, woe to you lawyers, for you've hidden the keys of knowledge. We'll put that in your pipe and smoke it. What does that mean? Woe to you lawyers, you've hidden the keys of knowledge. Well, here we are. For all these thousands of years, this planet's been spinning, and people have been struggling with each other starting about 30 years ago, that's no longer necessary. The people don't have to allow the lawyers to hide the keys of knowledge anymore. Here it is. Yes. Now's the time. If we want to 
if we want to honor those people that died for us, you want to celebrate Memorial Day, here's the way you celebrate Memorial Day. Stand up for those people that gave their lives for your right to be heard and make a record and call witnesses and demand justice. Stand up for them. If you won't stand up for yourself, stand up for them and stand up for your neighbor and, and teach people. This is something we all can learn. It ought to be in our schools. And if I live long enough, I hope it will be before I die. I think we should be teaching children the fundamentals of justice. What is justice? What is my obligation as a member of society? Do I have a duty? If I make a promise, should I be held to honor that promise or pay damages? What do I have to do? I don't think we're teaching our children that. They don't learn at church. They don't learn it at public school. Where are they going to learn it if we don't teach justice in the schools? And then we could teach what an interrogatory is, certainly in the junior junior high school, I'm sure it's not too hard for anybody to learn. It's not, it's just a word. And just simply a question in writing, they have to answer under oath. It's so simple. And all, the light came on 1997. Here I'd been a lawyer 10 years. I was as much in the dark as anybody else. But when the light came on, I said to myself, I can teach people this. Yes, I'm, I'm putting aside everything in my life to learn the law these days. I realize at my age, I've learned a lot of things over the years, prioritized learning many, many things. And how it is that I missed the law, like the thing that touches every aspect of life and controls so much of what goes on. And I just, it was a blind spot. And I'm making the correction very quickly. I'm turning that one around very fast. And your course is a, is a gem because it makes it easy and simple to come up to speed in a practical way. You can go to court like within immediately given the, the course that you've created and we're going to take a peek at it in a second i just have one more question some uh, some of the intimidation that people have about the system i've heard uh that they're worried about if they should take somebody to court and lose will they then be uh obligated to pay the the costs of their lawyers which then would be very expensive well i can i can address that from what the law is in florida and i think most of the states and, and every individual needs to check but most of the states follow the same principles. Uh, we have a statute in Florida, 57105, which says that if there is absolutely no issue, no genuine issue of material fact, and there never was, not even a scintilla, then the losing party may have to pay attorney's fees. Otherwise, it's either got to be in a contract, like when you buy a car on time, you sign a contract. And undoubtedly, if you look at that contract, you'll find that in the event of litigation, then the prevailing party will be entitled to recover court costs and attorney's fees, reasonable attorney's fees. Well, but you signed the contract. You made yourself liable to that. Then there are certain kinds of things, uh, you know, where, where there's a fraud or somebody's just committing a fraud on the court or just lying or whatever. Uh, then those people should be made to pay court costs and attorney's fees because they, they had no business getting into court that people died for. I mean, people, I take it seriously. You know, people died for my client's right to be heard and call witnesses and make a record and, and move the court. That's, that's what it's all about. So if you go in there in absolute, absolute foolishness, yes. But if you've got a legitimate claim, and in most states, if you have a legitimate claim, you don't pay attorney's fees just if you lose. And you don't win attorney's fees if you win unless there was a provision for that in the law to begin with or in a contract. So the thing is, you know, are you just not going to do anything? Because even if you hire a lawyer, if the lawyer loses, you have to pay your own lawyer and the other lawyer. So again, you're better off doing it yourself. At least if you have a hire a lawyer, you need to know what needs to be done and how to do it so that the lawyer that you hire will, you can make do what's right. That's right. That's right. I think you did touch on the general idea that lawyers don't always do the most expedient thing for your case, that they, they have other uh, objectives sometimes, other motivations, other loyalties. Um, we're not going to go into that, but because you kind of touched on that uh, already. I just want to have people have a, have a peek at the course. So um, this, is, this is what, look, here's the brief tour that I was talking about, the big picture, um, where in this one lesson, Dr. Graves really spells out pretty much everything you need to know, the big picture of, of, what, it, of what you need. Like, for example, here, CAT, complaint, answer, trial, simple, right? 
And then if you can count to five, you know the basics, the principles, the complaint, a flurry of motions, uh, then the answer, finally discovery, and then the trial. And he really sets you up to understand in a very clear way uh, what you need to prepare. And even to the point where uh, we understand that you pretty much once you walk into trial, you get yourself completely prepared and you know how you're going to win from the get-go before you even walk into the court. Here's a list of the lessons. You've got easy guide to procedures, what I was just showing you. And then you've got five hours of video and two and a half hours of audio seminar. And then all of these other lessons that are important. So yeah, I just want to show folks it is really well put together, very clear, very concise, uh, very enjoyable. You, you use humor uh, oftentimes, which helps to demystify it, to stop that voice in your head saying, oh, this is too complicated or it's too intimidating. I can't do this. Then, you know, there's something funny and you bring it right down to a human level and it, then it's easy again. So I, I do appreciate that. So what I want to do is I'm going to take a few questions from people. Dr. Graves is not here to answer any questions about any particular cases. Um, in order for him to be of greatest service, uh, he's determined that he needs to stay agnostic with regards to the various issues. So he's not going to, he's not going to answer questions about how you should win your case. So I just want to set that expectation right up front. That's an agreement that he and I made. It's very important to stick to that for his overall mission. You understand. And yet maybe you have some nagging question that has stopped you from jumping with both feet into advocating for yourself without a lawyer in a courtroom. Maybe there's um, some lawful distinction that you're confused on. And if you had some clarification, maybe that'll help you see, see through to a, a, your next step. And especially if you have questions about the course, how to win in court without a lawyer, those are the kinds of questions that we want to answer. Uh, so if you don't mind, Dr. Graves, can we take those kinds of questions? Let's go for it and see what happens. Let's okay. see what happens. Exactly. All right. Jamie. Hi. Um, I am on suspension just pending my termination from a county government, and they have a, a civil service um, commission that they want you to appeal, and it's kind of like a miniature hearing. Um, and then I can, like, appeal the termination that way, or should I... Um, not go that route and just go to court because they're saying that I am violating labor codes by not signing the documents and consenting to the weekly testing. And um, right, so there's that's a great question. There's so many uh, nowadays. It seems like proliferating all these different venues where people are meeting out justice and they're not in a regular court. So, Dr. Graves, what about all of these other venues? Uh, do they follow the same principles? Do you have to learn a whole other set of rules just to be successful in, in, in each and every venue? Well, there's a general principle that one must exhaust his administrative remedies before he can have standing to be in court. On the other hand, if uh, it, it comes to the point where uh, attempting to exhaust those administrative remedies is, uh, is impossible, uh, then then the court doors are open. But what to do and all that, we agreed that I'm, I'm, I can't risk my license by giving advice in California on how, what to do or what, where to go other right. than uh, just read the law. It's not hard to read. You can look that up. On the course, there's a link to the Google Scholar. It's a special link that lets you uh, put in your search terms and so forth and so on for the different states that you're looking at, the jurisdictions. And you can get answers to those questions. But uh, even if I were to tell you what to do, it doesn't make it the law. You have to still able to know what the law is and be able to cite the law. And when you go to court, say that, you know, California statute 6402-7 or whatever. Uh, and, and that's how you win, is citing the law, stating the law, making a record, getting evidence into the record and moving the court. It's not hard to do, but it has to be done a certain way uh, if, if you don't want to get upside down. Yeah, great. Great information. Remember, there's there's a maxim that the law will not require you to do an unlawful thing. I love it. Okay, great. Uh, let's hear from Jim. Thanks for being here, Jim. I have a question about, um, as far as jurisdictionary and, and understanding the procedures and whatnot, does it work for all um, types of processes? Like, 
I went through a trademark process actually and tried to do it myself along with the person who had the trademark. And we, we see, we got beat up real bad. Um, and it just seemed like, you know, when you do civil procedures, you go through, you can do motions and things like that. Does all that work with all types of legal processes? Um, does jurisdictionary apply to everything? Mm -hmm. um, no, jurisdictionary is all about litigation. There are some classes in there, a little bit about property, a little bit about this, that, and the other thing in the, in the uh, reference menu, but primarily it's for litigation. And uh, we, ha I had a, I got the trademark Justice. I own the trademark. If anybody wanted to have a magazine called Justice, believe it or not, there isn't a magazine called Justice. I don't, I, I can't imagine why, but they have to go through me. And I also got the trademark American Justice Foundation. And we had to fight to get that, believe it or not. Uh, but that's not litigation, normal litigation. So the answer, Jim, is uh, if you're going to get a trademark or you're going to you know, claim a bankruptcy, those types of things are outside the scope of litigation, a battle between two parties. Unless you need to fight the patent and trademark office with a lawsuit, then the course will be very helpful. Thanks for that question, Jim. Let's uh, let's go to Aaron now. Hello. Um, okay, so question. Um, I'm at the estoppel phase right now. Uh, I'm sending that in on Tuesday. What is the um, the next step? And I'm in, I'm in the Santa uh, Santa Clara County where um, you know the mandates are in place. They want you to be vaxxed. They want you testing. They want you masked up. So we're trying to fight all of that, of course. What's the next step in the course that um, that uh, Dr. Graves offers? Does it help you go through that process of what it would take to understand that here in the state of California? Well, in litigation where you do have two parties, uh, that both parties do have to participate. You can't do things without the other party and give notice yeah. and hearing. Uh, that's what due process is all about, is having actual notice and an opportunity to be heard. So... Uh, the, the issue I think that Aaron's asking about, I think, is what do you do when everything else fails, when you're not making progress, nothing's going forward, and the last resort is you need a court order. So when you need a court order, then you need to do what the course teaches. And until you need a court order, then you, you know, you're, you're working on something else, maybe preliminary to litigation, but you're not actually in litigation at that point. Okay, thank thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right, let's hear from Sean. Hey, Clint, how you doing? Hey, good. Hey, Frederick, thank you for uh, doing this thing here. Let me put, I'll put on my video here so I can, so everybody can see me too. Um, so I have two quick questions. <laughs> I try, you know what I mean? So I'm just sitting here working on a conditional acceptance. I'm actually teaching this. Uh, process as well. I'm a police officer in Maryland, and I do, uh, I teach the Constitution and things like that, but this is a good process I see to documenting, um, documenting this process and documenting to government agencies, private agencies, the way the commoner law has it set up. Can you talk about what the differences in per se versus pro persona versus su juris and how they kind of play a role in court? I'm not going to give you the answer that maybe you want, but let me tell you this. I tell people, forget about it. Like the old New York saying, you know, forget about it. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Just sign your name. Sign, Sean Matthews, period. You don't gain right. anything by telling them you're pro se or pro per or in persona, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, people say that, people ask me this for years, you know, well, what does it mean? Well, the, the one means you're not insane. You know, you you haven't been adjudicated an incapacitated person. You don't need to tell anybody that it it doesn't make you look brighter or smarter. In fact, I keep urging people in the course there, just people don't use legal terminology if you don't need to use it. Just be be plain about things. Right. You know, uh, Billy agreed to to paint my house. I gave him fifteen thousand dollars. He didn't paint my house. I've suffered damages. I want a judgment. It signed a paper, Sean Matthews, in proper, whatever, doesn't matter. 
pro se, it, it really doesn't make any difference because it, it's not helping you. In fact, what it may do is it may cause the judge to sit back and say, uh oh, got another nutcase coming here. Another one of these patriot people <laughs> going to play some kind of try yeah. to play some game with me. And all you're doing is setting yourself up for a, giving a bad impression. Just be yourself, be straightforward, and make your paperwork talk. Words that's count. Why, that's why. That's why I ask it just for the whole, you know, because I'm teaching it to other people, you know, and that's my experience. I go do court cases, but I'm sitting in criminal and traffic court cases. So, but one last question I want to ask you is. Getting a going the attorney route does that render a person uh, incompetent or incapable in court? When you file for an attorney or have an attorney represent you, does that actually render you like an incompetent in court or incapable of representing yourself no. in court? Is there anything no. in the courts that no you can fire your, that as a fire your lawyer if you hire a lawyer and you pay him and you don't like right. what he's doing and he's you you walk into the courtroom say hey pal you're done bye get out of right. here I'm taking over. Now, the exception would be there are people, you know, Sean, let's 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 be honest with each other here. There are people that go to court that don't know mud from sand. Yeah, absolutely. We agree, we agree about that, don't we? Yeah. And, and 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 some of them, you know, there's there's cats playing fiddles in the maple tree outside their house every night. I mean, there's some people that got, got some real problems. And sometimes the court will have those people evaluated and determined that they have to have a lawyer. They can't represent themselves. And, and here's the point. Again, people died. Thousands and thousands of, of, of young people didn't get to come home and have another slice of mom's apple pie so that you could go to court. And when we have these kind of yahoos going to court that are playing this kind of game and wasting everybody's time, it makes me upset, should make everybody upset, should make you upset. So when you go and you do this in a responsible way, you do it according to the rules, you will, be, you will find that the judges will pay attention to you. But if, if, you, if you wave some kind of flag, you know, that, you know, that I, I'm part of the patriot movement and you know, I'm above the law and my name's in all capital letters and you can't harm me or whatever, uh, don't expect to get a good reception. It doesn't work and don't call yourself pro se. Just go, be honest, be straightforward, use the rules that people died for and demand that these people obey the law. And if they don't obey the law, then you send them an affidavit that, explaining exactly what you did that is contrary to the law, what the law is, what the facts are, and uh, tell them to get off your back. Yeah, that's perfect. I appreciate it. It answers my question so I can help people understand this process, but it's also using the constitutions here in the state and the US constitution to, because that's what's being violated for, for a lot of government entities, military, Law enforcement, nurses, government run, sponsored, pay for hospitals and schools. So but it's a uh, it's great products. I appreciate you doing your uh, your session today. And thank you, Clint, for uh, doing these sessions as I tune in all the time. So we appreciate it everywhere across the country. Well, great. So to that's have all you, I got man. for you. Great. Thank to you, know Sean. You. Thank you. Yeah, what a great point to make. You know, we've got uh, lawyers on one side and the whole elite system. And then on the other side, we have people who have no problem have no shame and they're just going to walk into a court ill-prepared spouting off all kinds of things those people aren't helpful for us either that's uh really great all right edward what how are you what's your question okay so i'm a federal employee and what i'm running into is when they talk about violation of civil rights and stuff like that and i'm also a member of our, our union representation there so i'm kind of hitting this both sides uh, they talk about where well, you're not you don't have a civil right to your job and when you see the executive order come out, it came out, and I'm trying to remember, uh, I think it's five CFR, like 3301, 3302, and 7301 states that he has the ability to dictate this type of stuff in the executive branch. And since I fall under DOD, I fall under the executive branch. So this course I'm looking at, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I always like learn stuff. But what I'm trying to find out is, does this course have any relation to the uh, CFRs that they hold federal employees to? The course is all about how to win in court. Okay. Period. It, it's, it's how to file pleadings, how to understand what a cause of action is, what the factual elements are of a cause of action, how to get evidence into the record, how to move the court, how to set hearings, how to litigate, and how to win. How, basically, what it comes down to is how to get a judge to sign an order. 
I mean, that's really, I, I could sit here all day, but ultimately that's what it's about. Do you want a judge to sign an order? If you do, the course will help you. And if you want something else, then, you know, like the earlier fellow wanted to get a trademark, that, that's not what the course is about. So uh, whether or not, you know, that anybody has the right to require you to do anything is a matter of law. And the law changes for every kind of case. You know, I have people that, you know, I have one person that sued his, the company he was working for, they stole his copyright. He won $100,000 using my course, but they stole a copyright. They weren't trying to vaccinate him or anything. So it depends on what the case is about. But if you have what we call a cause of action to sue someone, then the course will be there for you. Or if someone is suing you and you want to make the argument, well, you don't have a cause of action that the court recognizes, or you don't have the necessary facts to establish a cause of action to sue me. So then I'm going to dis have your case dismissed or stricken or get rid of you altogether and, and, and that. So it, for defense, the course works. On offense, the course works. But it, 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 it's not there to talk about CFRs or, or any of that other stuff. That's all legal research, which is something that there is a class on how to do legal research and how to how to cite cases and how to do all that is in the course, but it, it's not particularly about you know what whether or not it's going to work in your case. I mean, every case that goes to court has different facts, Edward. Different facts. Yes, sir. I appreciate the information and to uh, attest to your previous comments about the veterans dying so that we have a legal system. I can assure you that countries that do not have a legal system is far away from what people here realize. Yeah. Well, it certainly is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Edward. Wow, thank you. How precious it is, our court system. We shall not take them for granted. All right, that looks like the, the last of our questions today. I wanna to thank our special presenter, Dr. Frederick Graves of How to Win in Court Without a Lawyer, an amazing class, uh, online, self-study, home study that will empower you and enable you to go to court and achieve justice and get a court order to achieve justice in your life in any variety of uh, areas of life. Any parting words for us, uh, Dr. Graves, you've given well, us- I just want to like to say my expertise is in litigation. It's, it's how to win a lawsuit, how to go to court, how to defend yourself or how to sue someone else. And when, we, when, when people ask me questions about, well, what should I do about this or what do you do next and so forth and so on, it, it Believe it or not, even though I disagree with the whole system, uh, and, and I really do disagree with an awful lot about it, the, the, the way that the lawyers are regulated and so forth, I have a license, and for me to go outside of teaching you what it takes to win, how you file pleadings, how you get motions set, how do you deal with judges, how do you stand up to lawyers, how do you keep lawyers from testifying, all those kinds of things. When people ask me, well, what, what do I do about this particular situation? Uh, I've already been attacked by the state of Maryland, among others, uh, claiming that I was practicing law in Maryland when my license is in Florida. And uh, I've got a family to support. So I try to avoid those questions. But when you come down to questions about, you know, well, how do you use a request for admissions? Or how do you get somebody to, uh, to put some record into the court file? Uh, how do you do this? How do you do that? My position is I believe everybody has a right to know these things that I teach and that without that knowledge, uh, you're pretty much in the dark. I hope that explains things. Yes, absolutely. That's, and it's really a call to everyone to once and for all understand the entirety of the litigation in the law such that you can, you can advocate for yourself in a court of law and win without a lawyer. It's time for that to happen. So a lot of the folks on the, on this line are are quick studies. They're they're they like me. They not focused on the law. Uh, not it's been a blind spot for me and many others. And um, recent uh, events have uh, forced them to pay attention for the first time. So they're learning very quickly. I have a lot of questions from very specific little detail kind of questions all the way up to the broadest questions about what is the law and everything in between. And that's why it's so important that you take the course that Dr. Graves has created because it really fills in that whole important area of you walking into the courtroom prepared, knowing what you're, what you're going to ask for and how you logically lead the judge 
to the motion to order what you need him to order. And that's the big, the big part of what you need to, to, to be self-sufficient in this way. Good. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome, Dr. Grace. I'm just glad to know you. I'm, I hope to work with you going forward. You know, just really help serve people to empower them, to let them know they can do this. Isn't that right? That's it. And they must. If you want to keep the Republic, you're going to have to fight for it. I think that's what, isn't that what uh, Franklin was in? He said, you, gentlemen, you have a Republic if you can keep it. And swords alone won't do it. It takes pens. And of course, right. word, word processors now. <laughs> it's the peaceful way to restore yes. the Republic. So you can, everyone, and you must. So thank you for being here, everyone. That's going to be our presentation for today. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank, you. thank you so much. Bless thank you, you both. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Grace. Thank you. Thank you. God bless thank everybody. Thank you. 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 God bless everybody. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. God bless America. I'll, I'll do I find the course.